fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back to the House of Mystery on KKNW 1150 AM Seattle. I'm your host today, Al Warren. Kev Thompson is out sick again. And uh, it's flu season. Now, uh, we're, we're sort of covering a lot about false confessions, and uh, uh, we've uh, been having all sorts of guests, and we're kind of going over cases that have uh, really kind of resulted in bad outcomes. And um, so we've got someone that knows a lot about, the, the, you know, the cases and, the, and, and innocence and false confessions. And so we've got him with us today. Uh, it's Ken Klonsky. Thank you for being here. Hi. Uh, how are you, Al? Well, not too bad. <laughs> so, 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 Ken, let's let's tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, who is Ken, and and um, how did you get involved in uh, false confessions? Oh, well, it uh, goes back to. Uh, the early part of uh, 2000s, um, I was a teacher in Toronto. Uh, I live in Vancouver now, and uh, I, I was a teacher in Toronto, and uh, our class saw The Hurricane together, the film with uh, Denzel Washington about uh, Reuben Hurricane Carter. And he happened to be living in Toronto, and the class uh, wrote to him and invited him to come and speak to us. Uh, which, uh, to my surprise, he agreed to do. And it was uh, a transforming experience uh, for all of us, Uh, different for me, of course, than them. Uh, For them, it was a validation. Uh, These were kids who basically didn't read and and write at all. They, uh, They were disinterested in education. And uh, after he appeared, uh, they turned their lives around, a lot of them, surprising a lot of them. Uh, I think all but one of them eventually graduated. So uh, the effect he had on me was uh, I heard ideas that uh, I had never heard before, and at first I wasn't sure, A, if I understood them, and uh, B, if they were really valid. Uh, But after thinking for a while, uh, I invited him to uh, participate in a uh, an interview for the Sun magazine uh, that operates out of uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And he agreed to do the interview, and this interview actually became the seed uh, of our relationship and of uh, my involvement in wrongful convictions. Uh, we uh, the the real, the, uh, the interview went very well, and uh, a lot of people got to look at it, especially people within prisons, because they uh, distribute for free uh, copies to prisons all over the United States. And one of the people who saw the article was David McCallum, uh, and he was a, a wrongly convicted young man from Brooklyn who had been uh, convicted with his friend, Willie Stuckey, uh, through uh, a false confession. And uh, these false confessions of two 16-year-olds were basically the foundation and the entire structure of the case. There was no evidence otherwise that they'd even been to Queens, New York, uh, to do the kidnapping, where the kidnapping originated, uh, that they could even drive a car, uh, and they supposedly had done a carjacking, uh, that they were uh, even capable of getting across the city from Brooklyn to Queens 
uh, I know that uh, I had grown up in New York, and even by age 21, uh, I would have had a very hard time driving from one borough like Queens to Brooklyn. Uh, so uh, all of it just didn't hang together. He, David had written to me and said he'd read this interview, and he sent uh, a kind of outline of the case. And I got back in touch with Ruben, and I said, you know, here's a young man who seems to need some help. At the very time Ruben was leaving uh, the Association in Defense of the Wrongly Convicted, uh, which is the foundational organization for wrongful convictions in Canada. And he had no place to go. Uh, he just left them because of a ethical dispute. And so he um, needed somebody to go off into the wilderness with him. And since I was uh, working with him uh, at the very beginning, at the very nascent stage of this case of McCallum, uh, Ruben said, well, you know, why don't you uh, join me and I'll uh, start a new organization called Innocence International. So that's essentially the, the beginning of the work that I did, and that, that happened around 2004. Wow. So now when you when you take cases on, how, how is it that you decide who's telling the truth or not? Because there's quite a, an opinion out there that, you know, everybody that gets convicted will say, well, I'm innocent, you know, even when they're not. That's kind of a thought that a lot of people have, and I've heard that a lot. Um, what's the determining factors, or are there any, or is it just a feel? Well, actually, the thought is incorrect. Uh, most prisoners do not claim innocence because innocence can't do you any good whatsoever inside a prison, especially if you are uh, looking for parole. In most cases, if you come before a parole board and say that you did not commit the crime, it's a confirmation to them that you're still a criminal without remorse. So innocence is uh, not often used by prisoners. Uh, more um, bravado is. Uh, there's pride in some of the crimes that were committed. But in my experience, innocence is not that common or claims of innocence. And if it goes on for 15 or 20 years, uh, you get some idea to begin with that the person may well be telling the truth. But that's not a, a good enough measure, uh, because wrongful conviction work is similar to archaeology. If the initial groundwork gives rise to suspicion that another world lives below the surface, you have to start uncovering the layers that prevent the average person from seeing the truth. Or as uh, Ruben used to say, uh, this uh, 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 defendant or the person inside the prison is covered under uh, 1,500 pounds of bullshit. And that's what you have to work through in order to make that decision. Usually it takes about a year. So now, I, I was going to say now, I've, I've, I've listened to your book. I didn't read it. <laughs> I listened. Uh, great book. Um, now, the Eye of a, a Hurricane type thing, it was from the um, Reuben uh, Carter case. What was the biggest surprise you got out of meeting him? I think that I was awed by his intelligence and his analysis of the world the way it is. Uh, also, his, um, his metaphysical beliefs. So it's uh, three things that uh, I found quite impressive. Uh, he, he was a brilliant man, and I, I hadn't expected that because he had no formal education, and he had spent, um, oh, over 30 years in some kind of uh, institution, uh, some kind of penal institution uh, throughout his life, and it didn't lead me to believe that uh, his education was going to be that powerful, but in fact, he was autodidact. Uh, he, um, he, in fact, uh, was very well educated because he made his, his um, 
prison cell, what he called a laboratory of the human spirit, and he read everything uh, about uh, uh, metaphysical, uh, not supernatural by any means, uh, but the, the whole uh, metaphysical structures of great religious thinkers throughout the uh, 19th and 20th century. So how, what was the connection between Reuben Carter and David McCollum? I was the connection. And in fact, I be, you know, as uh, the book Freeing David McCallum, uh, which I wrote after Reuben's death and David's release, uh, and that book uh, shows that if there's one function that I had, it was, or oh, two functions. One was sticking with the work and not letting uh, um, discouragement uh, make me give up on what was going on. And the second thing was I had to coordinate the work of a lot of people who were giving of their time and uh, uh, efforts uh, for no money whatsoever. These were some of the top professionals in the United States. And the reason they joined the case was Ruben his name. Uh, he had raised millions of dollars for innocence projects throughout the world, not just North America, but Australia, England. Uh, he's very, very well known in that field, more so than he was as a boxer. Now, now we're going to uh, bring up a, a part of the uh, justice system in Canada. Now, we're going to talk about the Mr. Big sting operation or technique, depending on what you want to call it. Now, this is something that's not allowed in the U.S. or the U.K., but it is in Canada. Now, maybe talk about what that is so the listeners kind of get an idea. What is the Mr. Big Sting? It's, um, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I, I don't think it should be allowed in this country, and they have put some restraint on it. Uh, I think it's absolutely disgusting. And the RCMP claims there have been very few mistakes, but the problem is that it's uh, very difficult to overturn convictions anywhere. There are people in prison right now in Canada who have been wrongly convicted through this Mr. Biggs thing. And the way it works is that they, they get a target, uh, some person who they believe they can um, uh, persuade uh, and um, influence and extort a confession out of, because there's nothing more effective to a jury than a confession from a person who uh, may or may not have done a crime. Confessions seem to be uh, airtight. It's counterintuitive to think that somebody would falsely confess to a crime they haven't done. So what Mr. Big does is it convinces, it's an elaborate hoax that convinces, and let's put it uh, personally here, or uh, Sebastian Burns, that he was part of an underworld gang ruled by this Mr. Big and if Sebastian cooperated by telling them about the murder he supposedly committed, Mr. Big would control events in, in his favor. Uh, and it, it not only, um, it, you know, he, ma he made it clear, Mr. Big, uh, Big Al, as his name was at that time, it, he made it clear that uh, there was evidence being gathered against uh, Sebastian down in Bellevue, Washington, that uh, would tie him to the killing of the Raffae family. But, uh, uh, in fact, that was a lie, and they actually produced a false newspaper account and showed it to Sebastian about how the, the authorities were closing in on him. And uh, uh, even uh, Mr. Big there agreed with him. He said, oh, well, this isn't true. But in fact, uh, um, Sebastian uh, was taken more in by the notion that he had to show solidarity with, uh, with Mr. Big. He had to say exactly what Mr. Big wanted him to say. Now, one of the ways they make this work was they pay money for the target to commit crimes. 
uh, the crimes that they've controlled, like money laundering, like uh, auto theft, um, where they are in total control. These are police uh, entrapping young people or people uh, in particular to commit these crimes. And it's also part of the discrediting of the subject when he comes to trial. Oh, this person commits criminal acts, therefore uh, he must be a criminal. But in fact, when you pay people money to do these things, uh, you are conditioning them and making them feel that it's okay because, hey, there's uh, money at the end of the rainbow. Now, Sebastian Burns and Atif Raffay came back from Bellevue after the murders of the Raffay family. And the press in Bellevue and in Washington made it appear they had fled from, uh, from Washington to get back to Canada after they'd done this deed. Uh, this was not true, but what happened was in Canada, people turned away from them. They thought they were guilty. And so they couldn't get jobs. They were totally discredited. And it made Mr. Big seem all that much more uh, persuasive because if you're getting paid, at least it's a kind of job. And they paid them in a very interesting way. Uh, I, I shouldn't say them because Atif Rafay was really not part of this sting operation until the very end. You pay... Uh, sometimes they paid him a lot of money, sometimes they wouldn't pay them, sometimes he paid them, oh, a small amount of money. And that's the most effective way of conditioning. Anyone who's done uh, Psychology 1 knows that if you give the same amount every time, uh, the person or the pigeon eventually gets a little bit bored and used to it. If you don't pay off at all, uh, you won't get uh, the behavior that you want. But if you pay off intermittently, then you get the highest rate of return. Uh, the, um, the, the target will be more tempted to come back and do what you want them to do. So that's a long way around of explaining it. Uh, there are more elements involved, but uh, suffice to say that uh, Sebastian Burns was entrapped into this, a as well as their friend uh, Jimmy Mayoshi. Right, right. So now, uh, and when you talked about fled, they actually took the bus from Seattle to Vancouver, right? They never, <laughs> it's not exactly fledding. I mean. <laughs> well, I, I think the issue is not what bus they took or, you know, how they drove or whatever it was. No, I, I, I mean, for me, the issue was, they were very clear they were coming back. They told the Canadian embassy, and the Americans knew that they were leaving. But it, it suited the Americans' purpose, the Bellevue police. Uh, they basically allowed them to leave with the idea that they would say they fled. Uh, if they had come up and, and escorted them to the border, then they would have been able to give them a kind of free pass. Okay, uh, they, they threw us out of Washington. We're back in, in, in B.C., but we, they have no evidence that we've committed any crime. But by just leaving it open, they knew that Sebastian and Atif were going to go back to Canada because there was no place for them to be in Washington. Atif had lost his entire family. Uh, the house was essentially ruined with uh, fingerprint dust and all kinds of things. There was no, there was no way that they were going to stay down there. Uh, Sebastian's family lived in West Vancouver, and they came back, uh, and that was exactly where the police knew they would come. I mean, where else are you going to go? You're going to go home. Right, right. Now, um, so they, they go home, and... Um so Sebastian gets caught up in this Mr. Big Sting and um, gets drawn in by doing things for the, P the undercover police, basically. Um, so where does it come up, the confession? And, and um, how, you know, it, you see, this is the question that will be asked a lot is, how can you confess to something you didn't do? Um, 
and why would you make up this you know the, the story of how you killed someone or killed people just because of uh, you know um, offers of money um, and things like that maybe exp I don't know if you can explain that well that's an important question uh, because it wasn't the offers of money that made um, Sebastian, quote-unquote, confess. First of all, I don't call what Sebastian did uh, to conf I, I don't liken it to confessing. Uh, when you confess to a crime <clears throat> to a police officer, you're given a warning that uh, anything you say may be used against you in court. That's a Miranda warning. That was, uh, uh, oh, it's a Supreme Court decision from way back. Now, when you're doing Mr. Big, you're talking to a bunch of gangsters. Uh, we're not, they, they're not talking to the police. They don't think they're talking to the police. Ergo, they're not talking to the police. They're talking to gangsters or police who are, are masquerading as gangsters. So what happens is uh, the gangsters say to them, uh, well, you know, you know all of these crooked things that we do because you've participated in them. So now we have to know how we can trust you. And the only way we can trust you is by you telling us what happened in Washington with the Raffae family. And for five months, Sebastian denied that he'd done anything to the Raffae family. You don't see that. Those tapes are never seen. The only tapes that are seen in the courtroom are the tapes that show him, quote-unquote, confessing. But if people would look at the Netflix confession tapes, they would see that these were two kids who were kind of full of this criminal braggadocio. They, they, you know, Sebastian was trying to appear like a uh, cool customer or whatever, but I, I think if you look closely, you can just see that he, his voice is very caught up. He's frightened, but he's also trying to look cool. And uh, I, I feel like what he did was not really confess, but he gave the gangsters what the gangsters seemed to need. And, and the story in his mind, as well as Atif's, was completely implausible. Uh, that they would commit this crime to get uh, money to make a movie, that they would um, take, well, it's Sebastian who basically took uh, credit for this, uh, they would take a baseball bat or whatever and bludgeon to death an entire family, two kids who had no criminal backgrounds and no examples of violence in their past. Uh, so they had to create, and I, I say more of Sebastian, had to create a scenario that they thought that the gangsters would accept because these gangsters were making it clear that, hey, uh, Sebastian, we know where your parents live. We know we could do anything we want to you, and we could also uh, make sure that uh, we treat you in the same way that we treated some of the others, which was basically to kill them. So Sebastian was frightened. These guys were very, very uh, convincing. And again, I don't consider what they did a confession. I consider it a way of warding off uh, possibly bad consequences. And I also feel, and I'll reiterate it, that the story he told is completely implausible. They were at a movie theater. The, the neighbors heard the killings. Uh, take place at the time where they were seen at a movie theater. Uh, so, for an example, the, the um, RCMP gangster says to him, well, how could you have been at the movie theater and committed this crime? Uh, and so Sebastian needs to answer that question to please the gangster. And Sebastian says, well, we snuck out the side door. Not that the timing was in any way possible, for them to get from, from Seattle, uh, a Seattle movie theater to Bellevue and commit this crime. But simply that is the only answer he could think of at that moment. Yeah. Now I have to bring in the, um, 
now the prosecution and their side of it is that what they say is uh, the the key parts of the confession, as they call it, or him talking on tape, was that um, they asked how he killed the three, and he said a metal baseball bat, which was true, and they said that that wasn't out, so how did he know that? And the other thing they said was um, that they, when they took him back for questioning after the murder, um, they, they questioned them and then they scanned them for blood and any residue and there was nothing on them. So when he was asked by the Mr. Big in the hotel how he could get away without having any blood on him, he said that he um, did it naked and showered and left. And uh, the luminol tests from the police showed lots of blood that had been in the shower, like it had been exposed to blood. So that that was the two key points that they came up with in response to this. How do you how do you answer that? Uh, well, as to the blood, uh, it could be answered in many ways. Uh, they, the only blood found in the shower, of course, was Mr. Raffae's blood. Uh, why was it in there? Uh, the, the people who did the killing could have washed the murder weapon off in the shower. Um, I, I don't think that the people who did the killing actually went in there and took a shower, but it's possible. Uh, yeah, they found Sebastian Burns' hair in the shower. Uh, that would be incriminating if Sebastian hadn't been living there for three days uh, showering in that very bathroom. Uh, frankly, I've never met an adolescent who cleans up the shower stall uh, when they use in even in their own home. So uh, that is completely fabricated. It's it, that's evidence that's not really evidence. Uh, I, I don't remember your first example there, uh, Al. Well, um, they were talking about the metal baseball bat and how it, it hadn't been out in public. But yet he was... No, that's not true. Oh, it, it was out of public. Uh, yes, um, in fact, an FBI informant and a known FBI informant admitted to be an FBI informant, even by Bob Thompson, the police chief, or sorry, the, the lead detective in the case. Uh, an FBI informant told them that a baseball bat was the weapon that was used and that he'd actually seen a bat in the back or in the trunk of a car uh, and he identified the people who showed him this bat. Uh, he was to us, a, a, again when you're an archaeologist and you go back and you look, he was a credible witness but they discounted him. They, they called him crazy. Uh, this uh, is beyond my understanding because he was the first person who um, uh, told them, uh, who gave them a description of the murder weapon, and this was right after the murder. So there's absolutely no truth whatsoever in the fact that Sebastian brought up this uh, um, baseball bat out of the clear blue sky. It was common knowledge. So now, what do you suggest that is the problem with... Um police on these cases. And, and before we get into the Mr. Big itself and the entrapment thought, I'm thinking because, first of all, the detectives like Thompson and the rest of them on the case in Bellevue were focused directly on the two boys. So, you know, so it's because of that that it leads to this Mr. Big investigation because they, they, weren't, really, they, they weren't really looking elsewhere. Their focus was on the boys, and they did it, and how, how do we get them? Um, how, how can we fix that issue? Uh, because cause then they put all the resources toward just the boys. Like there was another um, defense about uh, his parents praying in the wrong direction and it being a Muslim killing. So now the police never did follow up on that, did they? Um, <clears throat> I, I think there was some half-hearted attempt at follow-up. Uh, I don't think uh, anything was 
really chased down. Uh, my uh, reading of all uh, I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of pages of police accounts. Uh, they started out with the possibility that there was uh, an Islamic fundamentalist killing because Mr. Rafay was a moderate Muslim and he believed that uh, people of different religions should talk together. In fact, he was the head of the Canadian-Pakistani Friendship Association. Uh, this is not um, something that uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalists are happy about. They don't want to dilute the religion. Uh, these are people who believe in the, the word of the Koran, a literal uh, word of the Koran. And this goes around the world. There are Every religion has its kind of rock base uh, scripture, and some people believe that scripture is absolute and real, uh, that the solutions of the past apply to the present. Uh, pretty much the U.S. Constitution is somewhat like that, too, the difference between originalists and uh, people who uh, want the document to adjust to the times. Uh, so, um, uh, the problem begins, as you were saying initially, with the original investigative work. Uh, the police fastened on to these two guys because they were the easiest solution. Uh, you know, um, uh, it, it's called tunnel vision. And what happens in tunnel vision is that the police begin to see patterns and shapes that aren't really there. And they chase down the suspects based on a story they're putting together in their minds. Now, if you were to take the Muslim fundamentalist story, and also by um, extension here, the Sikh extremists who joined with them, uh, if you could take those stories as the base, you would put together a better overall story about who did this crime. But that's not what they did. They focused on Atif and Sebastian. And anything that led to the targets, uh, the target suspects, was taken as proof of guilt. Anything that led away from those suspects was discounted. And as I say, the process is referred to as tunnel vision. It's what caused the incarcerations of Sebastian Burns and Atif Rafay. Their quirky behavior after the murders of the Raffae family was taken as evidence of guilt. Uh, and people who saw some of the films of them at the memorial service thought, oh, these two guys, they're totally heartless. They should rot in hell. I mean, you cannot believe the amount of, <clears throat> of people who felt that they were guilty. I would say when we first came to Vancouver, 99% of the people here just accepted their guilt. And I would say after that Netflix piece, 10 years later, uh, we're definitely in a different world now. I, I get very few pieces on my website now that uh, say anything about their guilt. It's almost all innocence, and a lot of people have joined the cause. Um, now, the, f the fact that they were seen in a movie theater again at the time of the killings needed to be explained away. This is, to me, the single most important part of their alibi. So um, the fact that other suspects were named had to be explained away as somehow crazy or irrelevant or lacking in substance, even though the commission of a crime as bloody as, say, bludgeoning would have to produce some forensic evidence implicating the suspects. I mean, <clears throat> I would think so. Uh, you'd have... Uh, uh, as you were saying, the luminol tests. No blood in the hair whatsoever. No blood anywhere. Uh, either these were very clever uh, and, and ruthless killers, uh, Sebastian and Atif, or uh, how could they be so clever and get caught up in this uh, RCMP scheme? <clears throat> I don't know. I, I don't believe that they did it. In fact, I will say 100% that I know they didn't do it. Uh, they did it as much as I could have done it. But I understand where people would be taken in 
because the story that was told by the police and the prosecutors was more effective than the story that was told by the defense attorneys. Right. Right. And, and not only that, I mean, I know back in 94 when the uh, murders happened, um, you know, the whole ISIS and Islam thing wasn't like it is now. So p people kind of poo-pooed their uh, counter by saying that it was some sort of religious thing. Um, but And also the making a murderer and all of that Steve Avery thing comes out. And uh, people are questioning the... Um, convictions and and uh, false confessions a whole lot more now. Yeah, well there are two elements to your uh, to your comment there. The religious issue. <clears throat> you know when you um you hear people uh talk about uh the evils of Islamic fundamentalism, uh, first of all they do that in isolation. And it uh, uh, ties them to people like Donald Trump, who make uh, this seem like the evil empire of the present uh, trying to take over the world. Uh, but in fact, uh, again, fanaticism is not um, uh, rooted in one religion. Uh, but the problem for liberals, and I would put myself in that situation, I mean, I'm I would be considered a liberal if I lived in the United States. The problem is if you come out and speak about Islamic fundamentalists and uh, propensity for killing, you're right away put in that um, uh, political uh, posture of uh, Donald Trump uh, or people on the right. And it, it, the problem in the United States, as I see it right now, is everything is in two camps. Uh, either you're for Trump or you're against him, you're on the other side, and nobody's listening to anybody uh, in the middle. Nobody's, nobody's listening because they're so invested in their camp. So it's hard to come out and talk about Islamic fundamentalists doing this killing. Uh, it, it's, it's alarming and it's terrible, but it wasn't just uh, the Rafay killings. There were killings all around. Um, certainly, uh, there was a large presence of Islamic fundamentalists in the Seattle area, and by that I mean uh, Bellevue, Renton, Seattle, Tacoma, and these killings, uh, there were killings that were beyond the Rafe family. There were other family killings. There were other um, uh, murders of this sort, and there were other killings in uh, Vancouver. And the one thing that ties them together Again, we talk about archaeology. The one thing that ties these killings together is that the people who were killed were moderate Muslims, and they were uh, uh, targeted uh, because perhaps uh, they had closer relations to other religions. Uh, uh, this is factual. Uh, now, whether that it's coincidental, I don't know, but that's what it appears to us, that they were targeted in that way. So the religious angle is extremely important, and uh, that is, is a better story, as far as I'm concerned, than two kids killing their family, or, uh, sorry, uh, two kids, one of them killing his own family for uh, insurance money to make a movie. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, so now, why did the Americans allow the Canadian Mr. Big operation that was conducted on the boys in Canada, in a foreign country, um, an operation that would be considered entrapment and illegal and not usable in court in the U.S.? So how could they allow it in the court just because it was done by a different poli police agency. Like, that's confusing to me, because their own policing, they're not allowed to do such a thing. They couldn't do this operation in Seattle and bring it to court. It w just wouldn't happen. So why would they take this, as they call it, um, illegal operation and, and uh, wrongful um, sort of evidence into their courts in this case? 
Well, all along, since they had no evidence, they bargained, perhaps, or they thought, and, I, I, and they actually got what they wanted. The judge decided that since the evidence had been gathered in Canada, that it was okay, it was allowable in a U.S. courtroom. I think his decision was wrongheaded, and I think that the um, appeal decisions were atrocious that backed this up. Uh, I think uh, I, <clears throat> I spoke to a retired judge in Washington, and this retired judge told me that if an appeal court feels that the um, the defendant or defendants in this case are guilty, they will not rule against the prosecution on constitutional issues. Uh, m to me, this is terribly dangerous. Uh, to abandon your constitution in order to mete out the justice that you think is correct, uh, this is not uh, the way that the system is supposed to work. And that's why you get a lot of wrongful convictions. But in this particular case, the judge allowed it because it was gathered in Canada. And uh, I think that all along the prosecution felt this was their best bet. But I still th I don't see the I don't see it as being valid, um, not even saying whether they were guilty or not. I just don't see it as being valid, because what if, um, you know, uh, two gay men were in Syria and they get caught um, touching each other, and they're Americans, but yet, you know, they want to <coughs> prosecute them under their law, in that country, even though it could be. Like, I just don't see where you can bring in something that in your country it's illegal. Like, you are you know, it's not acceptable in your country, but yet you bring it in. It, it, it shouldn't, like, I, I just, I just it, it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, um, that's just one of those things. I just, I don't, I don't get how they allowed it. So I think that's wrong. Um, well, well, yeah. Well, we agree. <clears throat> well, what, what, what are the chances now of something changing or having their cases overturned? Now, I understand Burns has already used his appeals up, and uh, I guess Rafay still has one left, and that's what I've read last. I don't know if that's where it stands. Uh, yes, um, you're kind of right there. Um, Sebastian is finished on the appeal levels, uh, even the federal appeals. He lost his habeas. So Sebastian has reached the dead end on the appeals level, um, whereas Atif has taken every single issue in his case and um, gone through one uh, personal restraint petition after another, PRPs, uh, in order to build his case for the federal habeas. He is now ready for federal habeas, he's he's a couple of years behind uh, Sebastian. Um, now uh, it is possible for Atif to win his appeal and for Sebastian to stay in prison. Uh, it, it's it's possible for Atif to be retried and Sebastian not to be included. I don't think this possibility will happen, but it's possible. And the um, the other the only thing that can get Sebastian out of prison now is new evidence, and that's where we're working. Uh, that new evidence, all throughout any jurisdiction in the United States, can reopen a case, be it DNA or a retracted uh, witness retracting a statement. Uh, there are a number of grounds that are solid for new evidence. So uh, Atif is not at that point yet, but God, it's going to be awfully hard for Atif to win an appeal, a federal appeal, when Sebastian has lost his. Uh, it's it's going to be a strange situation if that happens. But Sebastian was in no condition to follow up on his appeals the way Atif is. Atif has maintained his kind of intellectual integrity. Uh, somehow he's still a whole person. He got married recently, whereas Sebastian is um, 
to say the least, a lost soul. He, he spent at least 10 years in solitary confinement, and this is not good for the health of uh, the human soul or the human intellect. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 pretty rough for sure. Um, now, now the Supreme Court in Canada has decided to tighten up its rules on the um, Mr. Big operation. Um, do you think they'll eventually um, outlaw it or make it so that they can't use such an operation in court for court evidence? I think they'll outlaw it when they find out how many more cases of wrongful convictions there are. Right now, the um, the RCMP boasts that they've had this huge success rate. But again, <clears throat> if you have a wrongly convicted person sitting in prison whose um, um, uh, sentence has not been overturned, they can claim that this was a valid conviction. Uh, even though I know myself of three cases in the prisons right now that are highly suspect, uh, uh, I would say uh, uh, one fellow, especially the Skiffington, uh, Wayne or Wade Skiffington, uh, who was convicted of killing his wife, I, I think is highly suspect, and I think he will be released. As to the court in Canada outlawing it, I think that will be done in time, uh, as I say, when it's discovered that there are more than uh, a handful of cases involved here. It's a very dangerous thing. Uh, and uh, frankly, I think it's an anomaly in the Canadian justice system, which is generally uh, far more progressive than the U.S. states. Right, right. Well, I, I'm just wondering if they do eventually um, outlaw it, if this would have an effect on the Rafay Burns case in the U.S. It might, but I, I, again, if you look at Burns and Rafay, their uh, guilt uh, which was presupposed and all of that, it, it, it was held up in a, in a court of law. And I, I don't think that it would affect their case, but you can see very clearly that their case would have been disallowed under the present rules uh, because there was no um, substantive evidence, forensic evidence especially, uh, implicating them in the crime it would have been very hard to justify using this Mr. Big to get a confession. Uh, they wouldn't have allowed it, plus the relative youth of uh, the defendants. They were the youngest people who were ever uh, given this uh, treatment, this uh, Mr. Big sting. And, you know, young people the age of 18, 19, their judgment is fairly poor. Uh, perhaps poorer in some ways than a 15 or 16 year old. Uh, their, their judgment is poor, uh, their hormones are running high, they're not, they don't think uh, clearly. Uh, th there is a lot of developing going on in the brain. So um, it were, they were too young uh, to be entrapped in this scheme and they were also, um, there was not sufficient evidence to justify it doesn't mean that that would in any way overturn their cases in Washington, but people will <clears throat> can see already that this was, this was not a legitimate use of the Mr. Biggs thing. Wow. So now um, let's uh, give the audience some information. Um, how do they get a hold of, uh, if they want to help in, uh, in these sort of cases, um, where should they go? Well, online, <clears throat> there's the RaffeBurnsAppeal.com. Uh, RaffeBurnsAppeal.com uh, has handled, oh, <clears throat> since, uh, since the confession tapes, I, I have to say, oh, five, six hundred uh, uh, various and sundry uh, um, responses, offers for help. And, uh, in fact, we're utilizing 15 people right now in terms of finding new evidence in this case. That's all the result of the confession tapes. But even before that, there was plenty of traffic. I mean, my website, KenKolinsky.com, has had a lot of traffic. Anyone who goes on there can see the amount of debates over this thing that's gone on over a 10-year period. 
actually about eight year period that uh, the website's been up. Um, and you can see how the attitudes toward them have changed. So if they wanted to help, I think the best way is um, rafaburnsappeal.com. Fantastic. Now, and your books are available at bookstores and Amazon, and we'll have it on our site as well. Oh, that's great. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, the other case is not about Burns and Rafay. It's about um, David McCallum, and I, I think we're going to talk with him on Wednesday. Uh, he'll be on as well as I, but um, the David McCallum case uh, <clears throat> was far different, and yet it also relied on uh, false confessions. That's That's what links them together. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to talking to him and, and talking to you. Well, it's been an interesting show, and, and I think there's going to be a lot more talk about this in the future. I mean, I, 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 mean, I hope there is. I hope people can um, get on this and, and uh, get some change happening because uh, we're taking away people's um, freedom, and I think we need to uh, uh, take it um, more serious. We need to have um, better evidence when you're going to take away someone's freedom for their life. Yes, and <clears throat> using a bit of imagination, you put yourself in their places. The door closes on you. You're stuck inside prison three 99-year consecutive sentences, 200 and what, <clears throat> 90, 297 years uh, in prison. Uh, this is such a despairing thing. And the state of Washington not having a parole system uh, makes it even more despairing. Wow, it's just uh, amazing. Uh, so there, uh, there's no parole system at all in Washington State. There is not. Uh, you have to serve your sentence. Uh, this is uh, a situation that I don't understand, but um, that is the way it is. Wow, that's crazy, hey? Well, um, our guest has been Ken Klonsky. Um Thank you very much for being on the show. Well, thank you all for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.